Hey everyone, this is lecture 9.1 and in this one we're going to talk about how poverty impacts community. So the major portion of this lecture focuses on what we call social isolation theory, which is uh, it's kind of complex, but it's also very simple. Uh, it's one of it's an amazingly elegant set of social theory. Um, so I really dig it. Uh, additionally, then we'll talk about some ramifications of that social isolation. So social isolation theory is most closely associated with a sociologist named William Julius Wilson. It is incredibly effective at explaining how urban minority neighborhoods uh, can uh, fall into this cycle of extreme reproducing poverty. Uh, Wilson specifically studied poor black neighborhoods in Chicago. So all of the dynamics in those neighborhoods uh, are really what Wilson is talking about, but this theory uh, has been proven and shown to be applicable to most, um, most poor uh, communities and especially poor urban communities. But again, you can apply it to poor uh, rural people too. So uh, William Julius Wilson explains that problems found in inner cities are caused by what he called concentration effects. So the concentration effects are each of them has the effect of making poverty a little bit harder and when all the more of them that are present the harder things become uh, so there's five on this slide five on the next slide uh, first is the lack of transportation if you are poor and you don't have a car you can't get other places unless there is viable public transit and the poorer a city is or the poorer a neighborhood is the less likely they are to have viable public transportation. Uh, for example, uh, here in Columbus, uh, the only bus that really works is the number two bus, and it goes up and down High Street, and most parts of High Street are actually uh, pretty well-off neighborhoods. Second, we have the lack of social services or government offices. So if you don't have those things, you can't get a driver's license, you can't get other forms of uh, identification, you can't access uh, certain programs that can help get you out of poverty. Food deserts. This is another component, I believe we've already addressed this in this class, uh, but in poorer neighborhoods, poorer areas, uh, grocery stores, big fancy grocery stores don't really want to um, put themselves there because they're in the business of making money, right? That's, that's capitalism. However, um, that really opens a window for uh, dollar stores. It opens a window for um, uh, convenience stores, which in and of themselves aren't terrible institutions, but they become kind of dangerous when you don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. That's really the key to it is access to fresh food that has not been uh, like canned or frozen or something like that. Financial desperation then, uh, these are uh, when people are desperate, meaning they are willing to start breaking the law to survive or for their kids, that then uh, can really cause a neighborhood to uh, deteriorate because they're stealing from other people and then um, people don't want to locate businesses in that town, etc., etc. All of these are layering on each other, right? If there's financial desperation, a food desert is more likely to develop. Uh, if there isn't any food in an area, or if there's no way to get to a place, government offices don't want to locate themselves there. Number five, undue attention from police. Or this could also uh, be uh, described as inappropriate policing. So uh, in a part of town that is known for being uh, troublesome or known for being dangerous to people in the community, those same uh, beliefs fall into the police force as well. So if uh, cops get a call that sounds like a really minor thing from the so-called troubled neighborhood, they might be less likely to go because they don't want to ha have anything to do with that. 
or if uh, they get a call from that same neighborhood, uh, they might be more likely to be hostile, right? The exact opposite there, because they have had problem in that neighborhood before, and that's kind of what they're going in expecting. There's, again, so many things apply to implicit bias. Um, so that undue attention from police, combined with all these other factors, makes a neighborhood hard to live in. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. There's only, I got this confused with another uh, theory. Uh, there's only five in strand theory. I mean, in social isolation theory. Uh, crime is indeed worse in bad neighborhoods. And this is explained very well by what we call Merton strain theory. Uh, that strain theory is relatively complex with a lot of categories, but the easiest way to explain it in relation to crime is that when poor people cannot attain the goals of society, when people can't get money legally, some of them will seek alternate means to get those goals. Some people, when they can't get money, will go do crime to get that money. And if you live in a neighborhood with more crime, you're, likely, you're also more likely to be a victim of crime because poor neighborhoods that have uh, the, there's crime occurring there, basically it's poor people stealing from poor people. Uh, and then due to de facto segregation, uh, black people are much more likely to commit crime against black people because when people commit crime, they're usually doing it not too far from where they live. Additionally then, this isn't only a police issue. Uh, when we talk about uh, inappropriate policing, um, even fire departments are less likely or less willing to go to dangerous areas. And this is due to past, past bad experience, right? Uh, oh, I, I misspoke there. And that, that too, but residents in neighborhoods may be less willing to call, say, the ambulance or the, um, the firefighters because they've had really bad experiences with, and maybe trauma with authority figures. Uh, police may over patrol bad neighborhoods and that over patrolling, that over threatening may cause those relationships uh, to damage, to break over time and really create very vicious cycles. Uh, these compounding concentration effects have the result of creating a social bubble that separates that neighborhood from the rest of the outside world. So thus, within that bubble of poverty, it creates cultural me coping mechanisms that may work within the bubble, but do not work outside of the bubble. So to put this a different way, poverty creates an, like an invisible social force field around a very poor place that people are less likely to uh, do business, less likely to even leave, actually, uh, they only stay in that bubble. Uh, that, um, and that's likely to happen in urban areas, uh, and which is almost harder to understand, but it certainly also happens in rural areas too, because rural, rural poor places, you actually physically can't get out of the area a lot of times. And then social isolation then is caused and maintained by constraints of macro level social structures and a lack of opportunities to escape. So there's no way to, that the schools are garbage, right? If the schools are garbage, there isn't a way to get out of the neighborhood, get out of the area, whatever, and try to build your own life. Uh, additionally, then there can be a lot of pressure to stay to help the community. And as hard as some people can try, some communities simply can't get, build themselves back. Um, and that, that creates a lot of very unfortunate uh, circumstances too. So let's talk about some of the ramifications of this isolation. So worn infrastructure is a big, big difference uh, in these zones uh, because the city is less likely to help these areas, because people are less likely to report things to the city to get help in them. We can get things like roads and sidewalks being really beat up. Uh, we can have areas where drainage and sewage don't operate. This can have 
a major impact. Uh, in destitute areas, it is not uncommon to have major uh, flooding, sewage flooding, that doesn't get taken care of. So we're talking about a literal poop smell outside where you live. Not only is that gross, that can be really, really bad for your day-to-day -day survival, when you, just psychologically, when you have to deal with that. Additionally, then, poor areas that have more crime are more likely to have their street lighting go bad because that street lighting has to be maintained by the city, right? So uh, with less street lighting then, and there's actually a really clear correlation here, the better street lighting you have, it actually does cause crime to go significantly down. Abandoned houses can be a big problem in uh, these social isolation bubbles because once a house is abandoned, if it's unable to be sold, then that can start harming the property values of other houses surrounding it, especially if people start doing drugs in those houses, if uh, people, uh, homeless people start to live in those houses, and especially, sometimes homeless people live in places like that, and they're not destructive, but sometimes homeless people, especially those who are uh, deeply mentally ill, aren't really able to live in a house like that, and as a result, because of their mental illness, and as a result, they, they can make a place not good to be neighbors with anymore. And that, that hurts property values. And then finally, on this slide, boarded up businesses also have a big, big problem there, because if business, all the businesses on Main Street, or even half of them on Main Street, are boarded up, that looks real bad. And that, thus, other businesses, including grocery stores, including doctor's offices, whatever, are less likely to put themselves in those communities because most of those institutions want to make money. Similarly, uh, just like education, much of the money that comes from infrastructure comes from state and local taxes. This is why rich towns look nicer right? It's not because rich people are more industrious. It's not because poor people are lazier or unable to see that things are falling apart. It's that when people own expensive homes, they pay more in taxes, and that more in taxes is able to pay for uh, things in those areas. Uh, so it's, it's busted in a very similar way to how school funding is busted. So uh, this is a quote from a person who lives in a neighborhood with severe sewage issues, like I just addressed. And just take this into consideration. Imagine this was you. People don't realize the toll it all takes. Not being able to flush your toilet, embarrassment when friends visit, the constant smell, the dirt and rust on your car, watching where you step when you walk, having all the money you've invested in your house disappear, feeling trapped, feeling like you let down your family, trying to encourage your children to see a bright future. All of these things are less possible when, from a sim simple problem of uh, really uh, untended to sewage problems which is the responsibility of the city to take care of. This then may be experienced by people who are living through natural disasters. And a, a situation similar to this uh, can also occur surrounding uh, hoarding. Uh, and hoarding behavior itself is often tied to trauma associated with poverty. That's, a, a, again, another pretty uh, tight correlation there. Modern segregation is, is more than just social structure. It's about unquestioned individual attitudes or behaviors. So um, what does that mean? Uh, it means that when you know a part of town is bad, you don't go to that part of town. That's part of identifying a part of town as being dangerous. If you really wanna help your community, if you really wanna help poor people out, go to those parts of town and spend money where you can. Try that. 
because and that may actually help them a lot now don't go shopping at the dollar tree right go shopping at like places where people are selling things small businesses all that stuff uh, maybe that's a good christmas shopping idea for you additionally negative attitudes on residential segregation ending what does that mean that means that some very racist people start to say things like man this neighborhood's really gone downhill that is coded language in among some people for this neighborhood isn't exclusively white anymore i i know people who have said this in the past and i haven't recognized it in the moment but on retrospect that's absolutely what they were talking about uh these these things are still persistent in society uh what we see this in something called the brazilianization effect which is a tough word to say um this is an international effect uh it happens in the united states it happens uh in other places as well the greater the social stratification in a given society the more brazilianization occurs right so the the farther hyper rich people are from hyper poor people means that uh these people will start living increasingly different lifestyles and especially the rich people will start separating themselves from the poor people these are actual photographs they look like they're two photos put together but you can see it in structures like the trees right and you can see it in the shadows uh in uh on the lines this is actually what areas look like uh from the sky um what so it's like there's a physical wall there and in some of those areas there actually is a physical wall there there are people living really close really poor people living very close to hyper rich people and they've just segregated themselves entirely uh, a really good example of this um, can be found in central ohio in columbus when you drive on east main street uh, you start downtown and you drive through bexley and then keep driving to whitehall within well first it occurs uh in that first little stretch uh between downtown and bexley is relatively poor and then bexley which is a well-off part of town is is very nice and then a couple blocks within a couple blocks when you're driving to whitehall from bexley again it just becomes very poor very very fast i honestly would uh, lead field trips just for that drive but it would be a little bit silly just to drive around as a field trip uh, a major detriment to living in poor neighborhoods, as I alluded to, is the lack of services. So things like businesses, social services, government offices. We talked about this a little bit already, so maybe I'll go a little faster over this. But the point here being that the lack of these organizations also means a lack of jobs, right? So when you don't have these things, you don't have jobs. When you don't have jobs, you have more poor people. Parks are another major uh, issue surrounding a uh, poverty uh, nice parts of town tend to have nice parks bad parts of town tend to have bad parks and in those bad parts of town you're more likely to have homeless people living in those parks because they literally don't have anywhere else to go and um, many of those homeless people do have untreated mental health issues and someone with untreated mental health issues can be frightening to people it can cause people to want to keep from try to avoid them and that is that's deeply unfortunate uh, on so many levels um an, another unfortunate element is that in many urban areas uh including where i live uh in parks uh, there is a rise of what's called by sociologists anti-homeless architecture. Uh, this is our elements added to public um, items such as park benches, such as uh, ledges. I, there's actually one of these at OSU that draw, I, makes me so angry. 
uh, I'll explain the bench first. You see that bar in the middle? That bar is not so that two um, relatively wide people can sit on a bench together and lay, let their arms there. That bar is to keep homeless people from being able to sleep on the bench. And that is, I, it's so cruel. It's so cruel because where else are they going to sleep? You know, if you're at the point where you're sleeping on a bench, you don't have any other choices. So basically you are leaving that homeless people with the only choice of sleeping on the ground. It's, it's, it really makes me very angry. Um, at OSU, there are a number of um, the, the edges of the big, uh, the, I guess you would call them uh, landscape features uh, with the big flower beds and all that stuff. You know, those ledges where you can sit? Well, in a number of places, those are separated out by metal bars that are about two and a half feet from each other. So it looks like it's meant that, oh, you should sit down here. And it does have a certain aesthetic effect but that is absolutely anti-homeless architecture. It's so that people can't sleep there and nobody wants to sleep there and no one will choose to sleep there. But if you don't have a choice on anywhere else, it, I, it's just such a cruel thing. Similarly, libraries are less likely to locate themselves in poor areas because poor areas, because of lack of education, have lower levels of literacy. And it's really hard additionally to read a lot if you have four jobs and a lack of childcare, right? Uh, if you're a super busy uh, single parent, right? Additionally then, there are also issues with uh, homeless people trying to uh, use libraries uh, and that bothers people. Well, homeless people are people too, indeed, right? So, and they don't have anywhere else to go. So you wind up having issues such as people bathing themselves in the bathrooms in the library or people uh, staying at just always being the library for like 10 hours. I mean, the libraries also exist to serve homeless people too, right? That is because it is for everybody. These public institutions, the library, the parks, they're for everybody. Uh, just because of who you are and how you look doesn't mean that you should be forced to not be in the library. Transportation, as I alluded to, can be a major issue if you uh, are poor and trying to escape poverty. Uh, the only thing I haven't really addressed here is that once you even get a car, if you can have a car, keeping it up is also incredibly expensive, and that's an expense that poor people simply can't deal with. Uh, banks are less likely to locate in poor neighborhoods. This is a little bit more of a subtle element. So in poor areas, there's no better way to uh, identify a poor area than multiple payday loan or check cashing places in the same little area. Uh, the big reason for that being that banks don't put themselves in poor neighborhoods because they want the attention of people who have a lot of money. Payday lending institutions, on the other hand, are intensely predatory. They, they say to people, okay, you need something, we'll give you some money now, and then you just come back and pay us back when you have money. The businesses themselves, their business plan are dependent on people not being able to pay those loans with their artificially high interest rates. Uh, if you know uh, much about um, uh, di different interpretations of different religions, many religions call those artificially high interest rates uh, usury or usury, uh, meaning it being unethical for those sorts of things. Um, it's, it's, it's a, again, a problem to drive people who are already poor even deeper into debt. And then, as I talked to already, basic retail, basic health care, targets don't locate themselves in super poor neighborhoods, right? 
I mean, Target clothes aren't the most fashionable sometimes, but it's good enough to get clothes, right? Uh, it, so basically, by virtue of living poor, you don't have any place to buy stuff, buy stuff to live. And that makes uh, life just so, so hard when it's already hard when you're poor. Okay, that is the end of this lecture. Uh, if you need anything, as always, just let me know.